The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When the days for Jesus' being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, Let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. To him, Jesus said, No one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what is left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. I, I hope you experience it as such. I mean, this is, uh, this is a really challenging gospel passage. Um, reminded of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who said, when a man is called, he's called to come forth and die. And we know that, of course, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, dying in a, in a Nazi concentration camp uh, for proclaiming uh, the, the faith, the true, I'd say, unadulterated Christian faith in, uh, in Nazi Germany certainly uh, uh, paid the price, the cost of discipleship. Um, do, we, do we feel that? And, and part, of the, part of our challenge to feel that is as to whether or not we, we experience uh, the, the urgency, the immediacy, the all-encompassing nature of the call of Christ, or if we are perhaps content to fit him into our little schemes or the schemes of our own lives. And this is part of what Jesus encounters uh, as, he, as he determines uh, to go to Jerusalem. So this, to, give the, to give the proper uh, frame for this particular little clip of the gospel, uh, we are, we're now in the ninth chapter of the gospel of, of Luke. And when we come back to ordinary time, we pick, we pick that up again, right? We pick up the regular cycle, making our, making our own journey uh, through the gospel of Luke. And if we uh, look, if, we, if we'd have had what is the 12th Sunday in ordinary time or the readings for the 12th Sunday in ordinary time, we would have seen that the gospel turns something of a corner. And what happens in uh, the, the passage immediately prior to this one is that Jesus takes his disciples away by themselves and he asks them, who do people think I am? And then he, and then he asks them a step further, who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter, Simon Peter, claims that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And from that point on, then, it's not so much the disciples, or Jesus' closest allies and associates, coming to see that he is the Messiah, but now it's time to see what the shape and character of Jesus' Messiahship looks like. Right? So they're say what they're saying is, yes, okay, you're, you are, you're the king. You're the king, and you are at the head of this new Israel movement, and we will follow you. Right? We know that you're the one that the Baptist proclaimed. You're the one that he pointed to. You're the one we've been waiting for, to live Israel out of this period of, of slavery and into uh, the, this new time of God's rule of freedom for us, for the sons of God, as we bring his rule to every corner of creation. Yes, yes to Jesus, and now the question is, how? So as he sets his face to Jerusalem, right, what, what, are we, what are we supposed to hear here? Is that, yes, Jesus is at the head of his people. He is going the way to Jerusalem, and it's the way of the cross. It's the way that gives God all glory and praise. It's the way of thanksgiving. 
And it's the way of service, humble service, all the way to the point of self-sacrifice. That this, this is what we see in the way of the cross. This is what we see in Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem. And what happens is they set, as they set out on that journey, right, immediately, I mean, with their, actually there's a, there is a few verses, there are a few verses before this one where the apostles are themselves squabbling amongst each other, like fig, vying for power and the rest, right? They've just said, we're going, and now they've got to figure out who's first among them because, of course, that's terribly significant. And then they, have, and then they, then they want to come... Um, as they're going, they, they're coming into a Samaritan village. Yep, we've just committed ourselves to God's way. We're going to go God's way. Jesus, the king, is at the head. And he, he sends us actually ahead of him, right? He sends messengers ahead of, ahead of him. Another word for messengers is angels. We're supposed to get some, some exodus thoughts in our head here, right? They're making their way to the promised land. The messengers go out ahead. They're not greeted with the right news. Okay, so let's call down fire upon them. <laughs> They're frustrating us, right? We're making our way. Jesus at the head. We're on our triumphal march to Jerusalem. We'll just burn everybody who stands in our way. Right? Just, just burn it all down. Because they're, they're refusing us. They're resisting us. So do away with them. Of course, Jesus comes back and, re and rebukes the sons of thunder, James and John. He rebukes them, and he says, no, like, we, we, we continue our journey, and as he continues his journey, again, this first part of the journey, we see something of, like, the living, the living parable of the, uh, the, the seeds and the sower, or the sower and the seeds, where we see seed scattered on the path. We see enthusiasm, right? As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, foxes have dens and birds have... He says, this is not the kind of movement that, that you think it is. All right, so let me, let me bring down your enthusiasm a little bit because you're enthusiastic probably about the wrong things. Yes, Jesus is making this royal procession, but again, it's, it's the way of the cross. So it's not a royal procession that leads to everyone around Jesus being exalted and celebrated and finding themselves with you know, masses of, of worldly power to exercise as they choose. And this is the kind of thing that people would have been excited about. I will, I'll go with you. Yeah, I'll go with you because I want, I want to be next. I want to get what's coming to me as a result of my following the true king. Jesus throws, that, throws some cold water on it. But then, he, but then things get serious, and especially for us, because we are, in fact, committed to Jesus. Yeah, and, and I know because just looking out, right, I've, I've seen these faces for more than just a couple of weeks, right? I've seen these faces for the, like when the seed is sown on the path, it sprouts immediately and then it withers and dies, right? It's scorched by the sun, it withers and dies. So we're not here. You guys, I don't know if I'd say you've, you've gotten beyond that initial stage of enthusiasm. <laughs> you're like, you're into the, to the drudgery of discipleship. No, you're in, you're, we're into like, here we're into the long journey of discipleship, right? And, but this is the challenge then that Jesus is going to, to issue to us today is, is to make sure that we are doing what we have committed to. This is a, and this is, this, is a, this is a big challenge because we have to take, we have to take up an, in response to the call of discipleship every day. We have to take up our cross in response to the call of discipleship every single day. Every single day. And what does it mean? It means firstly to prioritize Jesus. And, and look, at what, look at what it means. To another, Jesus says, follow me. I mean, so many people in the Gospels are desperate to hear this from Jesus, follow me. And we've heard that ourselves. Follow me. Yeah, want to live in response to him. But listen to, listen to um, I don't know what it is. Listen to perhaps like, I don't know if I'd say it's a reasonable objection, whatever. Okay, let me just get, let me just say what it is. Jesus, sorry, they, so the man says to Jesus, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. Now, what we have to understand about burying our father is that for, for a son, this is in, in Israel, in Judaism of, of that time, this was the most sacred duty that a man had. In fact, it trumps even prayer, burying one's father. So it's not nothing, right, that he comes to him and says, it's not like on a whim or whatever. Although what I'll say is, 
We don't know whether or not his father is dead yet. So is he, is he just putting Jesus off? Is he actually offering it? Is he issuing that as a, as a concern, a challenge? I have to go and bury my father. No matter, Jesus' words apply all the same. Let the dead bury their dead. Now, I don't know whether or not we hear that as harsh. To be honest, it doesn't matter. It, doesn't, it shouldn't matter. What Jesus is saying there applies now as well. Nothing at all, nothing whatsoever can trump the call to follow Jesus. Not even the most, not, not, this is, that's the most sacred duty that was put upon a son in that time. So there is nothing at all, there is no situation, there is no responsibility, duty, the rest, that you can even imagine that will come before following Jesus. I know, I can see, I can see Greg, he's trying to think of one, right? You think all day, get back to me, right? There is, not, there, is not, there is not one thing that trumps the call to follow Jesus. That is our life's priority. Now, I, I, could, I could leave you there, right? But you know, because I'm somewhat loquacious, I'm not, I wouldn't do that. But I could leave you there. That's, that's the important thing. That's, that's the take home. Is Jesus first in everything? In absolutely everything. And what does it mean? It means not just Jesus first, because we get lost in that. In that. And it's good, it's good to meditate on what that might mean, because it can mean any number of things. But it's not just Jesus first, it's also the way of Jesus first. Okay, here as Luke, as Luke gives us this sense of, you know, we're on the move. Yeah, we're on, we're on the move with Jesus, and we're walking towards Jerusalem with him. We're walking the way of the cross. That's what discipleship is. It's the way of trust and love. It's the way of worship and service, right? Because what, what's happening here is that Jesus' disciples, he has called into God's service. And then nothing at all is to, for us, those called into God's service, nothing at all is to be preferred to loving, trusting, and obeying God. This is, let me give it like a, a little bit of a wider frame on this as well. What does it mean to be called into God's service? What does it mean to be called by Christ? Here, right, he's the Messiah. He's the king. He's at the head of his new Israel movement. So we're called to be this new Israel. What is the, what is the new Israel? The new Israel is God's revitalizing and restoring force in his world. So we are set apart from other people in order to be exclusively about God and his purposes. We are the people. This is what defines us. We respond to Christ. Yes, 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 everything. Right? We respond to Christ. We prioritize Christ. Every time, every place, whatever. It's all, it's all Jesus for us. We're the Jesus people because we have to be the people who are about God's restoring, rejuvenating, revivifying purposes in the world. We have to bring light. We have to bring the world back to life. And we do it by virtue of our being called and equipped by Jesus to do it. We do it because he's called us to himself, and the equipping is his breathing his life into us so that we can be about his purposes in the world, so that we can go the way of worship and service, which is the way of prayer and love. He loves, he loves others best who loves God most. Right? He loves others best who loves God most. We're called, we're called to bring God's love to life in the world. We can only do it by loving God most by prioritizing God and his purposes, by giving ourselves totally over to him so that we prefer nothing other than the will of God. We prefer nothing other than him and what he wants to accomplish in us and through us. So he's called us to be that restorative force in the world.
and we have to be it, we are that by love. No matter what the demands of love are. Here we know that journeying to Jerusalem will cost Jesus his life. Love also, love costs us. It puts real demands on us. The love of God puts real demands on us. And we're eager to meet them with the, with the power that comes to us from Christ. And so we have, to go this, we have to go this way. We have to be a praying people. We have to be a people who entrust ourselves to Jesus. If we're not, look, if we're not looking for his, his guidance and, and direction, right, then we're, then we're still lost. We want to follow him on the way there. Even We know that discipleship will demand everything from us. And here, because Christ has called us, we eagerly give ourselves to him. And we pledge ourselves again this Sunday, as we do Sunday after Sunday, we pledge ourselves to be about God's work in the world. We will live totally for God and his purposes. Following Christ, giving our lives away, we ourselves will find abundance, fullness of life also for ourselves.